Hello and welcome back to Where Am I podcast episode 13, where we explore the world virtually because during this time it's still difficult to do so physically. I'd like to thank you uh, for joining me once again um, for the podcast and I'd just like to apologise uh, that this episode is uh, sort of airing a little later than usual, just with other projects um, going on and uh, other work and so forth. It's pushed back to the recording of this episode until Wednesday, but I hope to resume to a normal schedule next week. So last week in episode 12, we were at Khan Uni, where I gave you clues, as always, for where I would be in this week's episode. Again, now a few, few clues for you there on the screen right now. So... Let's go on. What were the clues I gave you last week? So again, we've got these images, which hopefully are quite big clues. But the clues I gave last time was a site that is renowned for its cave paintings or parietal art. It was rediscovered in 1940 by an 18-year-old uh, and his dog when his dog fell into a hole. And due to the popularity of visiting the site after it was discovered, the site was actually closed off to the public in 19. 63. Now this was actually guessed on my Instagram almost immediately after I posted a video from last week but again if it's the first time hearing these clues or you uh, haven't guessed it yet I'll just give you a couple of moments for you either to look at it or go and check my Instagram. Uh, whilst I'm just giving you those few moments you've so I think you can also pause the video. I would also just like to say I appreciate everyone who has helped me now reach over 900 followers on Instagram. So thank you all for that. And the general sort of growth of uh, Coffee Break Archaeology in general. So thank you very much. Couldn't do it without all you guys and gals or whatever. So I think that's probably enough time. And I was, in fact, at Lascaux Cave in France. In fact, in the Dordogne Valley near the village of Montiac. So let's have a look at a few quick facts about Lascaux then. So, as we said, it's located in the Dordogne Valley in France. Uh, the cave paintings and the sort of um, occupation of the site dates back to around 19,000 years ago or 17,000 BC during the Upper Paleolithic, a time of great change across uh, Europe, especially as this is sort of towards the end of the last glacial period. So there was a big change in climate, new landscapes were being formed uh, by the retreat of the ice, carving out new valleys and uh, new climates leading to new sort of animals being around, new foliage. And, you, and all kinds of different changes happening. So there are around about 600 paintings and around about 1,400 engravings in Lascaux that have been identified. It was discovered on the 12th of September 1914 when 18-year-old Marcel Ravadat, or how do you pronounce that, <laughs> when his dog Robot fell down into a hole. Ravadat uh, went actually back to fetch uh, three of his friends to help him rescue his dog. They entered the cave with a 15 metre or 15 foot shaft that they believed actually might lead to the legendary uh, entrance to the nearby Lascaux Manor, but they certainly were not expecting to find a cave system full of paintings. They returned on the 21st of September with a uh, Henry Brule, who was a local priest and archaeologist, uh, Dennis uh, Peroni, who was a curator of prehistory at the Museum of Les Isis, and a couple of others. Brule would go on to make um, sketches of the cave's artwork, which are still actually quite useful for this day due to later degradation, unfortunately, of the artwork. Uh, the cave was open to the public on the 14th of July 1948 and excavations at the site started a year later. But by the time of 1955, carbon dioxide, heat, humidity and other contaminants produced by 
you know, at this time, the site was was sort of reaching 1,200 visitors a day. And this led to visible degradation of the paintings. And the cave was eventually closed to the public in 1963. Uh, but replicas of the artwork and um, of the caves were reproduced so people could still access the artwork that way. And uh, since then, actually, since the, um, the um, cave has been closed, the, the cave is still suffering from a series of mould growths, um, really going up until quite recently, although they think they've got it under control now, but it's still suffering um, with those. So the replicas of Lascaux, which have been made, you've got what is known as Lascaux 2, which was an exact copy of the Hall of the Bulls that was displayed at the Grand uh, Palais in Paris uh, before then being displayed from 1983, um, close to where the cave is, uh, from the original cave. And it was a, a sort of a compromise and attempt to present an impression of the painting's scale and composition for the public without harming the originals. Then you've got Lescal uh, 3, which is a series of five exact reproductions of cave art from the nave and the shaft that since 2012 has been sort of been going on a sort of a worldwide tour, allowing the knowledge and and the sort of appreciation of the art from the Lascaux to be viewed and shared by a greater uh, audience than um, was that has been possible previously. And you've got Lascaux 4, which is a reasonably recent um, development, which uh, has basically an, an uh, establishment of a uh, new sort of museum or centre, uh, just uh, sort of in the hill overlooking Mondiac, um, which has uh, a very um, accurate re replica and reproduction of the artwork, um, which also integrates uh, sort of a new uh, digital technologies to uh, help display the artwork and help people learn about it. But let's sort of move back to the original and look at the images that were in Lascaux. We'll explore the images. So as we said, around 600 cave paintings and 1,400 engravings have been identified at Lascaux. Um, different areas of the caves were given different names, uh, sort of separate the areas. You've got the Hall of the Bulls, the Axial Gallery, the Passageway, the Apse, the Shaft, the Nave, the Chamber of the Felines. There's also uh, the Mund Milk Gallery or the Moon Milk, um, but there's an absence of artwork in this particular gallery, gallery due to its high ceilings and very cum crumbly textures uh, on the wall from stalagmite and stalactite. Um, <laughs> from stalagmite and stalactite uh, groves, space, groves, basically. Um, so between these 600 cave paintings and engravings, about 6,000 figures can be identified and grouped into three main groups of animals, humans, uh, and, and uh, anthropomorphs or human-like uh, beings, and abstract signs and geometric beings patterns. Over 900 can be identified as uh, animals, um, but around 605 can be accurately uh, identified, uh, so sort of more um, precisely. Around 364 of which are equines or horses, 19 of the paintings of stags and around 30 of cattle and bison, 30 each that is. And the other images are made up of seven felines, a bird, a bear, a rhinoceros and human-like figures. Oddly, there are no reindeer represented in the cave, although these are likely to be the main food source of the hunter-gatherers uh, who were making these images. So how were these images created? 
there were sort of a choice of tools or uh, production methods, which basically comes down to painting, drawing and engraving, which depended greatly on the characteristics of the rock surfaces on which uh, they were being made. For example, in the Hall of the Balls and the Axel Gallery, the space is characterised by white calcite that is very coarse and high reflective. This would made engraving it very difficult, but making it much easier to draw or paint on. And almost uh, the opposite to that, you've got the passageway, the apse, the nave and the chamber of felines, uh, which were mainly uh, limestone walled, which had eroded away, which made it much more suitable for engravings. The surface was a lot softer. Um, and although there are pigment, there is pigment present in quite a lot of these engravings, the main method this would have had to be applied to the walls is likely to have been through a, uh, a tube, blowing through a tube either made of animal bone or made of um, wood or reeds or some form of plant matter. If you try to replace it with, apply it with a brush in these instances, this may have actually caused um, distortion to the image that you were trying to create. And in some instances, actually, they use the natural rock features within the cave to create part of the image. So only drawing them part on and then using the natural sort of contours of the rock to uh, act as other parts of the image. Although this um, doesn't seem, although this was, was done, the actual amount of rock that could have been used to create these images is much greater than where they've actually done it. So the opportunity was a lot greater than what was actually undertaken by the uh, Paleolithic uh, cave artists. So a lot of these images, when you think about the location of these images, last scale, these images are at the back of a big, big cave. It is very dark and a lot of these um, images were also high up on the walls and onto the ceilings. So sort of going between both walls and the ceil ceilings. And, you know, in places this was between two and a half to three and a half metres high. Um, which would have been very obviously difficult to uh, brush without the use of either um, the construction of some form of scaffolding or using natural perches. But the trouble with natural perches is not all are present where they were. And other people have suggested maybe uh, longer brushes or other such devices, but the way that these images are drawn, that the, the technique doesn't imply that. It implies that people were up close and they were brushing this on or using a blowpipe. So this would have had to be done with some form of scaffolding. These places, as we said, are very dark. There is no natural light where these images are being drawn. These are deep within the cave, far away from the entrance. So there must have been some form of artificial light source that was being used. Um, evidence have been found of this at um, Lascaux during the excavation in the shaft, a red landstone uh, lamp was discovered. This lamp was highly uh, crafted, highly polished, it was engraved and it had a fitted handle. And in total, about 100 lamps have been found with it. Uh, throughout Lascaux, but not all these are as highly decorated as a sandstone lamp. Most of these are sort of just limestone plates with a hollow portion for the fuel, likely animal fat. And there's also evidence for halves and charcoal deposits on the floor for where people are lighting halves to help light the areas. Pigments. So what were they using as paint. Well, the colour palette of the Paleolithic cave painter included black, dark browns, reds, yellows, and in very rare cases, a sort of mauve-like colour. Uh, only pigments of mineral origin have survived to this day, although during excavations and investigations and research into Lascaux, they haven't found any evidence at all 
of any organic pigments uh, being used um, in any of the artwork. Analysis of the pigments reveals the use of oxides, uh, iron or ochre and manganese, as well as charcoal, but charcoal was used to a much lesser extent. The, um, and what is really interesting is the appearance of manganese. Manganese is not local to the area around Lascaux. The closest natural area where it's found is around about 150 miles away in the central Pyrenees. Now, this is quite interesting because this suggests the possibility of quite a sophisticated trading network in order to get the manganese all the way from the Pyrenees to Lascaux and some of the other um, cave sites as well in the area to carry out these paintings. And the fact that they were obviously deliberately choosing manganese over charcoal for the most part or potentially other pigments black appears quite a l heavily in the paintings at Lascaux and it is coming from a very very far away which gives interesting implications to potential upper paleolithic economies and in some of the paintings rather than just being uh, blown directly on or brushed directly on they may have been mixed with animal fat or calcium rich groundwater or clay in a suspension to form the paint of some of the paintings in the cave and the techniques uh, used um, bone and flint tools were used. We found evidence uh, during the excavations of bone and flint tools, both used in the mixing and probably the application um, of paint and for the engraving on the walls. Paint was also uh, applied using fingers, brushes made from animal hair or moss, blown using tube uh, made from plant material. And it is also thought that maybe they made stencils out of animal hides to do certain bits of artwork as well. So that's what we know from the cave walls. We've got these series of very impressive cave paintings depicting a large variety of animals. What is actually quite peculiar, it doesn't actually, none of the cave paintings um show foliage or any any kind of floral representations that have been in the local landscape and they don't show you know the most sort of common thing they were likely to be eating the reindeer um and we may get we'll get onto a bit why that might be a little bit later on but what can you know the excavation the archaeology of the cave floors tell us about these Paleolithic, Upper Paleolithic cave painters. Very little, generally, very little uh, stone or bone artifacts are recovered from these sort of Paleolithic sanctuary and cave sites. Lascaux, though, is the exception. Um, there were quite a large quantity of bone and um, uh, flint or, or lithic remains found. They're, Lascaux can sort of be broken up into three main phases of occupation uh, between the Upper Paleolithic and the Holocene, so the beginning of our current geological, although that varies depending on who you talk to, that we may be in a new one, but our new geological epoch. And um, the oldest evidence comes from the passageway and the nave and the shaft areas of the Lascaux caves. Charcoal remains indicate a very brief period of activity, but this isn't related to any of the cave art. This may relate to uh, initial areas looking for places maybe to do the artwork, maybe very brief occupation as a shelter. Mm, there's not really enough evidence to say. The second phase, though, it is contemporary with the cave paintings or the parietal art, and this also appeared where the majority of the bone and stone artefacts also belong. Many of these objects were used for either painting or engraving or other tools, but many uh, are decorative items or items which do not uh, necessarily have an immediate functional use. And the final phase is sort of limited to activity around the entrance, the cave, 
entrance of the cave and the passageway. But again, it's quite sporadic. It's quite difficult to sort of build up a picture of what is happening during this period. So what uh, other artefacts were found in the cave? Well, getting on to the topic of jewellery, 16 shells with perforation, so with holes made in them, um, were found indicating that they were potentially used as uh, jewellery, as maybe a necklace. Uh, many of them also included fossils, which is very handy for helping us identify where they may have came from. And they came from somewhere in Western France. And again, this is quite a trek away from the Dordogne, a couple of hundred miles. Again, indicating interesting uh, Upper Paleolithic trade economies, uh, the potential for quite a big um, ne uh, trading network. Again, lots of lithic uh, objects, many associated with engraving activities, but also uh, woodworking tools as well. Bone objects, again, you have antler picks and things which appear to be used in either engraving or in the mixing of paints and pigments. But you also see um, eyed needles, awls and other antler objects, decorative objects. And some of these decorations do also appear to share the iconography of the cave. So similar engravings on these objects are similar to the ones which are found on the cave walls. So again this has been a very sort of brief look at, uh, at, at Lascaux. There's a lot of information out there about Lascaux, lots of wonderful um, digital tours of the caves, uh, which I'll link in the description. It's why I've not shown a lot of images here, um, partly for copyright issues and partly for, I really wanted this to be a brief visitation, highlight some important key facts and look a little bit at the interpretation of the site, but then um, provide the information for you to go and have a look for yourself. So dating. So there's been several attempts to sort of date the uh, Lascaux caves. A series of carbon dates uh, have been taken from Lascaux. The first dates were taken back in 1951, which were obtained from charcoal from excavations in the shaft. And these gave dates between sort of 15,500 uh, BP or 17,500 years ago, roughly. But um, further date, dates were created during the 50s from further excavations in the passageway and the shaft, which then gave uh, dates of around about 19,000 sorry, 17,000 years ago. It wasn't um, before, obviously, BP, before present. That was 15,500 years ago, 13,500 BC. The second set of dates gave a range of somewhere of between sort of 17,100 and to around 6,000 uh, years BP, respectively, from the, from the passageway in the shaft. Then, uh, between 1998 and 2002, a new series of radiocarbon dates were taken from reindeer antler baton, which gave dates uh, of around about 18,600 years ago to 18,900 years ago. And again, you know, there's still uh, other sort of dates being suggested around about that time. It may be a little bit later based off the sort of cultures that are represented within the painting and within the artefacts. However, I mean, this may actually show a series of different occupations um, and uh, painting activity. You know, all these um, paintings are unlikely to all be done at once, and it's likely the site was reused for many generations potentially. So, this could just indicate different areas of activity um, from the datable evidence that we have. So, interpretation. I mean, even the interpretation of modern art can be very, very difficult. People uh, differ on, you know, what they see, what they feel when they look at these paintings. So, the 
interpretation of Paleolithic art can be very, very tricky indeed. Is it just art for art's sake? This is incredibly unlikely due to the location of the art, the difficulties of access and the huge amounts of effort that went into creating these images. So it is very, very unlikely it is just art for art's sake. But if it's not, then what is it for? Well, some theorise that the art might be a record of hunting success or a form of ritual magic or sympathetic magic to improve the hunting success of the future. This is quite a traditional interpretation of the um, of the uh, cave cave paintings and engravings. There have been anthropological comparisons to the San people of southern Africa that suggest that this sort of art represents visions and uh, the artwork is spiritual in nature. Um, again, anthropological comparisons do have their issues just because the artwork may show similarities between uh, tribal cult modern tribal cultures doesn't mean that there is a shared value. Just because people look at sort of modern tribal cultures uh, doesn't mean that, you know, this, and it doesn't mean that even in those cultures that, you know, ideas have remained static. Some also suggest that sites like Lascaux and other cave sites might be the site of sanctuaries or used for initiation ceremonies. Um, again, that is quite a popular view. And other people claim that maybe it's a creation story uh, through seasons and rebirth and death, all linked to the importance of hunting, what is available in each season. Um, this is down partly to looking at how a lot of these um, paintings are constructed with the horses being drawn first because they are available in the landscape in the spring or in the earlier seasons and then other um, animals being drawn later at later periods during or, or they are the next to be drawn because they appear in the next season. Now, I'm not necessarily convinced of any of necessarily these explanations. And again, if the site is being used over a period of time, then maybe they it's being used for different things or the, the, the artist's ideas change. You know, there's not just a static um, belief going on here. But what do you think? I mean, this is still highly open to interpretation and I want to aid you with what you think maybe by showing you possibly my favourite image of uh, Lascaux which is probably one of the most famous ones from Lascaux actually which is the uh, bird man and the oracle or the bull and the bird stick. Now many people have interpreted this uh, the bird man as maybe as a shaman and this is a vision of something or another the orc um, appears to have a spear going through it. Um, so people might think this is a representation of a hunt or maybe it is a um, shamanistic uh, vision of a hunt or hunt-like event. But look at the image, what do you think? And whilst you're thinking of that, I just want to put maybe Lascaux maybe in a bit more context. I just want you to, as you're thinking, close your eyes for a moment and take yourself back, you know, 19,000 years ago to the Dordogne in France. The landscape, as I said, this is a period of climate change. This is the retreat, starting of the retreat of the... Uh, last glacial maximum of the ice sheets and the sort of birth of a new landscape. You approach up the rocky slope up to Lascaux, you enter the cave and you walk down through the darkness of the cave. You walk down into one of the galleries, the passageway, the axle, get the hall, the 
balls, for example, and you look up with your little torch and you see these paintings. You might even see people painting them. You might even there to be painting them yourselves. What do you think your impression would be? What do you feel? All artwork, in a way, is supposed to invoke feelings or invoke some form of emotion. So what do you feel when looking at these? Why do you think these were being painted? If you were there, could be maybe if you set yourself back and you think of yourself being there, could you maybe come up with an explanation? So just take a few moments to think about that. Again, a lot could be said about Lascaux. Um, but I here I just wanted to provide the very brief facts. And I didn't want to show a lot of different images of Lascaux because those can be viewed in a much better way. And again, I'll have links to those in uh, the description. Do go and have a look at them. Do have a look at some of the tours around Lascaux, which show you the artwork in the replicated caves anyway. Um, it is a fantastic image and again just think about having to undertake those paintings in a dark smoke filled area you're up on a scaff wooden scaffold with your brush or your blowpipe or your antler to do the engraving it's dark it's smoky what do you feel how do you feel what do you think that would be like so that is the end of looking at Lascaux, which really just brings us to the clues for episode 14. So these are the clues for where I will be next week. I'll be at a famous Arist culture burial site in East Yorkshire. Three chariot burials make up the site. The village, the site is near and makes up part of the site's name, has an unusual name with two interpretations. Interpretation one, a field for the trial of a legal action or wet field. So those are your clues for where I'll be next week. Again, this has been a very quick look at Lascaux and some of the important points or facts about Lascaux and the creation of the artwork at Lascaux. Again, go and look at the um, links I've put in the description to get a better idea of what the cave paintings were actually like. And let me know in the comments which one your favourite is. Say mine is of the uh, Oracle of the Bull and the um, the bird man of Lascaux, the bird shaman or whatever that does represent. And I'd just like to say thank you very much for tuning in and until next time, take care.